Good evening, gospel revolutionaries around this entire world. Let me scoop this up. Voila. <laughs> I just didn't feel like I was close enough to you. <laughs> and some of you say, no, no, back off, Mike. Uh, hi, uh, this is Michael Littleborn Williams coming to you from our adjustable office here in Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh, we are going to continue our uh, research into the term generation. I I thought I knew what I was going to do. I came in here to uh, do just a bit of research because all of this has uh, been uh, kind of going around in my mind. It is turning into a mammoth study instead of just a little clarification here or there. And uh, so we're going to be continue on uh, I was I actually was going to go into the times where Jesus spoke to that generation, which he lived in, which was the last generation. And uh, we've explained that to you. We'll explain it more to you in such nitty gritty detail. You're going to be sick of me. So. <laughs> but we hope you're not sick of the gospel. The, uh, uh, the thing that I was going to go into was listing all of the ones that Jesus said, if it had been um, them, they would have repented a long time ago. It was really uh, uh, kind of a laundry list. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, would have repented. He said, uh, goodness, if um, uh, uh, whoever it was that traveled for the to hear the wisdom of Solomon, if uh, she would have uh, uh, that one greater than Solomon said she traveled 3,000 miles to hear Solomon and one much greater than Solomon's here in this generation. And you guys are stupid. <laughs> but to give them a break, it was designated stupidity. It was imposed stupidity. And it is the word uh, stupor, like a stupor. There's a difference between being stupid and uh, uh, and ignorant. To be stupid means you don't have the ability to learn. To be ignorant really is the word ignore. It means you are ignoring the facts. And uh, you run into uh, people like this. I try my best not to be an ignorant or stupid person. Uh, but uh, I've had to put effort into it. I don't know about you, but uh, if uh, ignorance and stupidity are not by default, I don't know what is because you got to educate yourself out of that stuff and um, uh, and drop the right to be right. Oh my gosh, what a detriment. Uh, but I, I got in here and started this and it didn't go that way. So I'm going to just go the way that uh, this has evolved I want to uh, clarify again as we start that Jesus was speaking to the very last generation, uh, that generation that he was speaking to, that he said would all things would be fulfilled, all the law and all the prophets, everything would be fulfilled. This is the 70th week of Daniel, which the church, the Christianity has put on hold the 70th week of Daniel because if the 70th week of Daniel has been fulfilled, there's no reason for Christianity. Point blank, game over. <laughs> uh, check and see if your church believes that the 70th week of Daniel has been fulfilled yet. If they tell you no, what they're telling you is they do not know the gospel. The 70th week of Daniel is the fulfillment of all things, which is Christ. So uh, there's a lot to learn, uh, and we uh, learn through uh, lists uh, in two of the Gospels, uh, one a maternal and another paternal, uh, one a legal, one a bloodline, and uh, people say, oh my gosh, they're different. Well, they're different for a reason. They're, they're designed to be different. We'll go into that another time, but it's amazing how ignorant people, and I do mean ignorant, ignoring the facts, think that they have got something because these lists are different. It's like if you would just take the time to look, you would know why they are different. 
However, that's not what I'm teaching on tonight. There were all of these generations. There were 14 generations from David to the cross. And uh, those 14 generations from David, as we put the little post on there, that uh, Saul ruled until 1000 BCE, which began the reign of David. And what we're beginning to see now is that this reign of David uh, was the thousand year reign of Christ. And uh, my goodness, the, uh, the amount of information that is in this, it is going to take an entire conference to get to this inf information about the thousand year reign of Christ and also uh, uh, Jesus or Christ being seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. Two very important points that uh, people teach on as something in the future. And we're wanting to show you the proper context of these two major things that just get flung around to wherever. And this generation gets flung around to wherever and for whoever. And when is this generation going to come? This generation ended. And uh, that the, the power of the Christ is that a new generation started in him that never ends. There, we're not counting generations. As I was doing this research, I uh, looked across a couple of uh, websites and they're trying meticulously to figure out how many generations it's been since Christ. And since Christ then, I don't know why I'm using this accent, but <laughs> they just look like they talk that way. <laughs> And since Christ, then this is all, all, uh, all of this the next generation is the, this generation is the next and the last one. And well, it's been, uh, 51, 52 generations since the cross. You can make something out of it if you want, but in God's economy, there's only been one generation. And that one generation is a righteous generation. And, uh, it has been uninterrupted generation ever since the resurrection of Christ. Uh, if you do not believe in judgment, you do not believe in the Christ. You can believe in Jesus and you can even have a personal Jesus. You can make Jesus into anything you want. Uh, uh, you can make him your Walmart parking attendant. Uh, I know a lot of people that do that. <laughs> uh, uh, however, when you identify Jesus as the Christ, everything changes about Jesus. The issue of personal suddenly is removed from all of this. You see, the disciples knew Jesus personally. There was not a need to know, uh, to know anything about him. Uh, uh, the thing about him being the Christ is a revelation that comes later on. Remember, uh, Jesus asked them, who do men say that I am? And, you know, a couple of the disciples took a shot at it. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, finally Peter speaks up and says, you know, that you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And I got kind of tickled today when I was thinking about it because, uh, Peter was just so dumb. <laughs> it just... Uh, everything that was ever explained to him, it had to be three times. And everything that he had explained to him when he went and talked about it, he, he didn't explain it. He didn't even explain what is written that was told him. He was told by Jesus three times in the letting down of the sheet story, uh, don't call unclean what I have already cleansed. It took him three times to get that message across to him. And then when he went running back, all excited to the uh, Jews and, and said, oh, I have such good news. Even the Gentiles can be saved. Well, that wasn't the message at all. Uh, you know, again, eh, thanks for playing uh, Peter uh, or Pete, as I've started calling him now. So uh, Pete got it wrong. So I, I, it kind of tickled me when I realized that Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. <laughs> uh, because, uh, uh, for uh, and, and Pete, for you to get this, oh my, it had to be God for sure if you got it. Uh, I played that little uh, story in my mind. It may not fit in yours, but I just got a kick out of it. 
of just this surprise. And then what we've had people to do with the verse about it, uh, thou art Peter. First off, he said, you know, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you that I am the Christ. Uh, uh, he said, but my father uh, has that information. My father had that information and, uh, and that revelation. And then uh, he goes on to say that you're, you are Peter and upon this rock will I build my church. And uh, what he's referring to is the revelation that he's the Christ. And he's saying, I'm gonna build my church on this. Well, the, the name Peter means rock, but the term rock in the verse is not the term, uh, the Greek term for Peter. Go look it up for yourself. It's so simple, it's ridiculous that uh, uh, more than a billion people uh, stand on this single verse uh, to justify something that is not true. Uh, uh, the church was not built on the apostle Peter. Uh, just no, no confirmation of that anywhere whatsoever except within the confines of Catholicism. Uh, but when you embrace Christ, then everything changes. Just kind of like uh, 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 Jesus told Peter that day. He said, uh, you know, who are you? And they said, well, some say you're Moses. Some say you're uh, uh, the um, uh, John the Baptist. Some say you're uh, Elijah. Um, but uh, then came Peter and said, but I say you are the Christ. And that's when Jesus laid down the marker for everything that would happen from that point forward that of what all things would be built on, on this issue of the Christ. And there's a lot of you that have diminished the Christ to embrace a personal Jesus. I'm really, I'm begging you to stop this. I did it most all of my life and uh, I did not realize that I was dishonoring Christ by making Jesus my own personal Lord and Savior, because that just is not the truth about the Christ. Uh, the term Christ itself is universal. There's nothing about the term Christ that is anything personal whatsoever. Uh, Jesus had personal encounters, uh, but this issue of him being the Christ is something else altogether. You see, if you do not believe in judgment, you don't believe in the Christ because the Christ came to take all judgment. Now, and for you Christians who think that judgment is still yet to come, you also don't believe in the Christ. Oh, well, you've got a Jesus. I'm, I'm not doubting that you have some definition of Jesus, but uh, you could call him Elijah. You could call him John the Baptist. You could call, call him a Baptist if you want to. Uh, but if you think that judgment is still coming, you do not know Christ. You just don't know Christ. Uh, and your personal relationship with Jesus is the greatest stumbling block to truth that you have ever experienced it and ever experienced, and you don't even know it yet. We're asking that you stop and open your eyes and look and see. Uh, if there uh, if there was never judgment and never wrath then uh, any old Jesus would do. You see, if judgment and wrath never existed, then just any old Jesus would do. That, I mean, you can make Jesus into anything you want. And that's why there are 46,000 denominations is because uh, people have made Jesus into anything they want, everything except the Christ. And uh, we're, goodness, I, we're in so deep now, this is going to take uh, forever to get through it, and I'm okay with that if you are. <laughs> uh, if there is still a judgment to come, if there is still a judgment to come, any old Jesus will do. Uh, because, but not the one, the Christ, the, uh, the anointed one, the one of God, uh, the, the first begotten of the Father, uh, this Christ that, uh, like I said in one of the programs, I used to think Christ was Jesus' last name. Uh, but uh, ever since Jesus is the Christ, everything changed. All things change when Jesus is 
Christ. Nothing changes when Jesus is Jesus. He's, he's simply the son of Mary. Uh, there's not anything changes with just Jesus. But the Christ, uh, there's a lot of people in uh, uh, Spanish-speaking countries that their name is uh, Jesus. Jesus is, is Jesus. Uh, he ended the last age and the last generation. Uh, Bible prophecy is all uh, wrapped up about certain ages and generations and times and years and all of these things. And as we told you, the 70th year of Daniel was fulfilled at the cross. And uh, man, I tell you, some of you are ready for an, a wonderful uh, divine awakening about the Christ. And um, uh, he started a new generation that will never end. So the Christ that, that brought an end to all generations, it's amazing how that they're all laid out in 14 groups of 14. And we are about to learn some things about these things that uh, you, believe me, you'll be glad you lived long enough to learn them. I know that I am. But what Jesus brought an end to was the last age and the last generation and, uh, and he brought about the end of the, the world so that he could bring about a world, an age, a generation that would never end. And that age has never ended. If you hear people trying to explain Bible prophecy based on the ages counted and numbered as they were before Christ, why isn't there a list of generations after Christ? They certainly had the room and the time to do it. But uh, nobody seemed to think that that was important. Uh, so a new generation started, and that incredible new generation is a generation of righteousness. Uh, please listen to the uh, Friday show uh, that will be out uh, this coming uh, Thursday. Oh my gosh, what an incredible thing we have gone into uh, it will be revolutionary. I will guarantee you that. One, uh, one thing that surprised me, that stopped me in my tracks. So this is where I'm going to stop in my tracks in this teaching. And that's Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. And Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, Michael, why did that stop you in your tracks? Because I went to the Greek to go to Ganea, and Ganea, Ganea here. <laughs> uh, so suddenly this word generation, I thought, well, it's funny that it's singular, but that sometimes is implied and sometimes... Uh, uh, it uh, gets added for seemingly no reason, and sometimes there's a reason for it. But here it is singular, and it says, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What's different about this? Number one, the word generation is not Ganea. It is Genesis. Uh, how many of you remember when we found the genesis of the church? Uh, Christianity has been saying that the genesis of the church was uh, uh, when the church became the body of Christ. However, Christ himself and Paul both identified the ecclesia, the church, the very same one, uh, and uh, identified the very same way as being manifested the first time when the law was given. That was the genesis of the church as far as Paul is concerned and Jesus. Now that genesis began there and then eventually became the whole world, which is the body of Christ. But this is really astonishing and there's more here than what my little head's gonna be able to wrap around for you, me, or anybody else, we're all going to have to do some research here. So where does Christ start? Well, Matthew says that the genesis of Christ is in David. The genesis, the beginning of Christ, 
is in Abraham. Uh, we know also that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So one could say that the genesis of the Christ was before the foundation of the world. So uh, as we look back into this now, what we are going to do is uh, revolutionary. It is radical. We are terminating the futuristic search for Christ and we are doing an about face and we are looking back into the Hebrew scriptures to have everything about Christ defined. You know, when Jesus said to search the scriptures, uh, the law, the Psalms, and the prophets, because it is all about him, you know, we had that singularly down to the day of the cross. Then we kind of expanded it to the death, burial, and resurrection, the day of the Lord. And then we uh, went back to from the birth of Christ. And we're dumb, folks. We, <laughs> we're not stupid and we're not ignorant. We're just learning. And uh, some, But we admit that we there's things that we don't know. And now we have found out that the genesis of the church was at, at Mount uh, Sinai. And uh, now we're finding out the genesis of the Christ is not in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Christ, was the culmination of all things about the Christ. But Jesus said that you're going to have to find him in this. Now, this term generation in Psalms uh, chapter 90, uh, it tells us about, and he's talking about David, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, we'll give you a, a, a place to do some research, and that's uh, Psalms 89 and 90. And look for David, look for the Messiah, look for the thousand-year reign of Christ. Um, and uh, what is said here, as we uh, told you the last time, we caught Sneaky Pete reverse engineering this verse, but when I realized after I got off uh, the air and was no longer recording that that thousand, uh, thousand years that has passed is as a day. And oh my gosh, with the context and the contextual view of that, that means that the last thousand years before the cross can and just may qualify as the day of the Lord. <laughs>